New years often mean new beginnings, and if you followed video game related headlines in 2017, you'll know that nobody needs a fresh start more than EA. The publishing giant posted another banner year in 2017, with over $5 billion in total revenue. But if you ask anyone who plays games, the very name EA incites disgust. Studio closures, game cancellations, and yes, microtransactions all contributed to another year where EA took a beating in the arena of public opinion. So why exactly is EA, a company that's won two worst company in America votes in 2012 and 2013, continually fighting to be in gamers' good graces, despite posting substantial earnings? To be frank, it's because their decision making is often centered around pleasing shareholders instead of the fans of their game. That general philosophy, plus a few headline worthy gaps, have EA and core gamers crosshairs once again. But it isn't all doom and gloom. With any problem that arises, there are endless possibilities for solutions. What would I do to fix EA's image problem in the gaming community? Buckle up, because I've got a few ideas. Now bear in mind that I'm going to stay as realistic as possible in listing out my suggestions for EA. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they said none of their games in 2018 would have microtransactions? But simply put, the model is making EA and other publishers boatloads of money, so they're not going to abandon it just to please the vocal minority. That said, Looking at how EA handles some of its marquee franchises, it's hard not to imagine them making changes down the road to please those that are frustrated. Number 1. Make Ultimate Team a free-to-play app Now if you play Madden and FIFA every year, you're probably already familiar with Ultimate Team, EA's fantasy-style game mode that tasks you with collecting different versions of your favorite players and using them to compete in online matches. If it reminds you of a free-to-play mobile app, it's because it's almost directly inspired by them. Only in order to play Ultimate Team every year, you'll need to continually fork over 60 bucks for the new edition of FIFA or Madden. Now it isn't inherently wrong that EA make you purchase a new copy of either game to keep playing Ultimate Team content, but wouldn't it be nice if it wasn't locked behind a $60 paywall? It honestly makes sense for EA to release a standalone free-to-play version of Ultimate Team for Xbox, PS4, and even the Switch. By doing so, they're exponentially expanding their player pool to include those who are turned off by yearly sports releases, but would be intrigued by Ultimate Team's addictive blend of simulation and collecting. More people means more opportunity for monetization, right? And considering that Ultimate Team already contributes over $800 million annually to EA's revenue, enticing more players with a truly free-to-play product would increase that number exponentially. Not only that, but EA would still sell millions of copies of Madden and FIFA for those who want a traditional sports experience. Now it may sound far-fetched, but it could happen. Why? Because EA is already thinking about adopting a games-as-service model for its marquee sports franchises. Instead of dropping $60 a year on new rosters and marginal upgrades to visuals and gameplay, EA is toying with the idea of charging you a flat monthly fee for FIFA and Madden subscription services, which would include free annual updates that would take the place of physical releases. Releasing its most popular game mode as a standalone free-to-play app, even for a short while, could serve as a good barometer of interest in the games of service model for EA sports titles. Number 2. Develop and release Battlefield Bad Company 3 as a $40 single player game and continue to dedicate manpower and resources to smaller story driven experiences. Now this one is a bit more implausible because EA has already shut down one of the last few studios it had working on story driven experiences in visceral games. In doing so, EA also committed to developing more open world sandbox style games. Think Destiny, The Division, and EA's own upcoming Anthem. That being said, 2017 proved that story-driven content can succeed, and it can do so without the dreaded $60 price tag or in-game monetization. Look at the successes of Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, Uncharted The Lost Legacy, and Dishonored 2 Death of the Outsider. All three were short, single-player driven experiences that didn't add on tacked-on multiplayer modes or unnecessary side quests to justify a $60 price tag. EA, despite their current commitment to releasing service games, could benefit a ton from releasing smaller, tighter entries in its most popular franchises. Now, Battlefield Bad Company 3 comes to mind because it's one of the few first-person shooter franchises remaining that's known for its storytelling. Fans of the series have been clamoring for its return for almost a decade, and EA has already released three multiplayer-focused Battlefield games this generation. Releasing a Bad Company sequel at a non-exploitive price point would do wonders for EA in terms of gamer goodwill. But it shouldn't end at Bad Company 3. 
EA has to show a commitment to smaller, less expensive games as a means of expanding their portfolio, something they've only done on a minimal level so far this generation. Bay and A Way Out are a good start, but if EA wants to prove that they're more than annualized multiplayer experiences, they must continue to take chances and invest in games that aren't guaranteed successes. Number 3. Transparent Pricing and Clear Release Schedules While this may seem obvious on paper, I've noticed EA published games have become increasingly convoluted in its pricing scale. It's one thing if you have special editions of your releases, but it's an entirely different and shadier thing if those different versions release on different days. If you were to look up the release date for Star Wars Battlefront 2, you'd either get November 8th, 2017 or November 17th, 2017. The November 8th, 2017 release date was for the Deluxe Elite Trooper edition of the game, and the November 17th release day was for the worldwide release of the base game. Now forget for a moment that those who bought the deluxe edition of the game were essentially buying an early leg up over the competition and consider this. There are people who walked into their local game store on November 8th and paid $80 for a deluxe edition of the game because it was the only SKU available at the time. It happened to me when I bought Madden 18. Every piece of promotional material I had seen and heard suggested one release date, but when I went into the store on that release date, only the $80 GOAT edition was available. Simply put. It's a deceptive practice, one in which EA takes advantage of the uninformed casual gamer in order to squeeze 20 extra dollars out of them. Now there's nothing wrong with EA offering deluxe editions of their most popular games, but staggering their release dates as a means of enticing gamers to purchase the more expensive version is exceptionally scummy. Now I'm only hitting the tip of the iceberg, but these are just a few simple ideas that'll help EA improve its image in the eyes of gamers. The crazy thing is that none of these ideas are incredibly risky or dramatic for EA. All it takes is a willingness to experiment and even fail at times. Developing a successful video game isn't just about building shareholder value. It's about committing to a vision and being willing to take a risk on that vision. EA make good games, but if they want to make great games again, they have to be willing to take those types of risks.